Hmm, Boris. Haunted houses. You know, I do love them so. It's, they're just so chilling and gloomy. <laughs> and of course, of course, the best writer of horror haunted houses was, well, Edgar Allan Poe himself. In fact, his best known works of a eerie, creepy haunted house and its occupants is the fall of the House of Usher. <laughs> I mean, as you can see, we have a wonderful poster over here that, that denotes, well, the fall of the House of Usher. <laughs> and, and it's, whoa, it's so wonderful to have here at Gargoyle Manor another haunted house and, and cursed houses as well. Yes, the, the uh, House of Usher was very much cursed, Boris. I mean, Poe, he, 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 he had a sense of dramatics about him, you know. He, he, he had the fear of being buried alive. And, well, that's what exactly what the uh, House of Usher is all about. The Lady Madeline and her brother Roderick were suffering from this, well, such a malady that they just couldn't cope. And, well, anyway... Tonight's feature, I guess you guessed it, dear folks, <laughs> here on Monster Movie Night, uh, is The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> so, let I, Bobby Gum Monster, your internet horror host, along with Boris T. Buzzard, usher you into a house of horrors, of curses of laments of being buried alive. <laughs> so let's go over to the old internet keyboard and put it in, that's right, Fall of the House of Usher, Edgar Allan Poe. That's right, now let's tune in into the internet haunted TV. <laughs> I've been watching it. Arthur. Same again all round, Arthur. Ah, 
Here's Gretel. How are you doing? Don't worry him. I've got him mated on the move. Good evening, gentlemen. Good Hello evening. there. Hello. What's going on here? Scott just told us a damn good hurry yarn. Hmm. Can't say I care for that sort of thing myself. Give me a good laugh every time. Oh, I don't know. You don't get much thrill out of life nowadays. Talking of horror stories, the tales of Edgar Allan Poe take a lot of beating. As a matter of fact, he's rather a weakness of mine. What I like about his stories is that you're never quite sure what happened in the end. It's more or less left to the imagination. Have you read The Pit and the Pendulum? That's one of the best. For sheer unearthly horror, you can't beat The Fall of the House of Usher. It's a story of a house enshrouded in mystery of weird happenings, of the strange wanderings of the Lady Madeline in the woods at night. If there's a copy here, I'll show you what I mean. Ah, here it is. The whole thing centers round the house itself. There's a sort of uncanny atmosphere about it. Nothing definite, a suggestion of decay, of approaching dissolution, which is reflected in the minds of the characters. The morbid Roderick Usher, last of the line, and his ill-fated twin, the Lady Madeline. To this house, on a damp, depressing autumn afternoon, comes Roderick's boyhood friend, Jonathan. The one sane element in the story, which is told in Jonathan's own words. soundless day. I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country. The bleakness of the landscape made me feel depressed and dejected. The dark, low-lying clouds scurrying along seemingly but a few feet from my head and the monotonous, flat countryside through which I passed. The twisted branches of the barren trees reached out as if to clutch me. It was as if nature was asking me to return, to retrace my steps from whence I came. Yet some irresistible urge within my soul, whether for good or evil, forced me onwards to whatever fate awaited me. Well do I remember that journey and all that followed. Had I been permitted to see the future, I would have turned back. Now all that happened is but a memory, a memory so horrible and fantastic, yet so vivid and real, it will haunt me for the rest of my life. As the shades of evening drew on, I found myself within view of the melancholy house of Usher. And with the first glimpse of the building, a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit.
Ah, good evening, sir. I beg, sir, to introduce myself. Dr. Cordwell, physician to the family of Asha. I feel I must tell you, you are entering a most unhappy house. Heed my warning and leave, while the chance is yours. Although I was a little surprised and disturbed at the doctor's words, I had little time for reflection, as shortly I approached the study of my friend, Roderick. Roderick. Jonathan, my friend, you can't know how I've been awaiting your arrival. The time has hung so heavily, my head ached with impatience. How could I refuse to come after your letter? My letter? Yes, my letter. Please, sit down. You can't know how earnestly I've been waiting for you to come. I am alone here. I need your companionship to bring me out of myself. You mentioned my letter. Yes, from the sound of your letter, you seemed unwell. So naturally, I hastened to come. I am glad. My illness is a family evil, and one for which I despair to find a remedy. It is a mere nervous affection and will undoubtedly soon pass off. But until it does, I'm sure there is no remedy. I find only the most insipid food endurable. I can wear clothes only of a certain texture. The scent of all flowers is oppressive to me. My eyes are tortured by the faintest light. All sounds are horrible except for my stringed instruments here. And there, my friend, you can judge how I've been living. Overshadowed by this illness, which is utterly incomprehensible, sometimes I despair. In this unnerved and pitiable condition, I feel that the time will come, sooner or later, when I must abandon reason and life together. But an illness such as this, my friend, must have some foundation, some reason. Reason enough there is, Jonathan. My sister, my sole companion for many years, and my last and only relative, has been severely ill. If Lady Madeline dies, she will leave me the last of the ancient race of ushers.
Good evening, my dear fiends. Good evening. I am Bobby Gamonster of Monster Movie Night, along with my co-host and pal, Boris T. Buzzard. <laughs> this is a public service announcement. You know, you monsters out there and monster kids and monster adults and in between and older and younger and et cetera, et cetera, I want you to be safe. That's right, while you're watching Monster Movie Night, we, Boris and I, want you to be safe in this world of trying times, along with this virus that's been going along. I want you to take precautions, just like everyone else. Boris and I have taken precautions. We have the hazmat suit on, and of course I covered my wonderful top hat in TP or toilet paper, along with Boris as well. Now. There's other things that you can do, like, well, let's see, Boris, there's masks, you know, goggles for the eyes, and masks that you either can buy or have made, such as this wonderful little mask here uh, that's got Tinkerbell, Tinkerbell. Uh, well, my wife, she made this for, for uh, herself and myself. Mine has monsters on it, of course. <laughs> Uh, and and basically you just like this right Boris you just stick it right over here and if you have ears you take these wonderful little ringlets and you stick them on unfortunately Boris doesn't have uh, ears but uh, anyway that's that's how that works let's see what else we can do uh, to be safe well of course wearing gloves you know uh, that helps a lot but the biggest thing Thing. The biggest thing, right, Boris, is to wash your hands. And, you know, every hand counts. You never know where it's been or where it's going. So I suggest you get some Germ Monster Eliminator. That's right. Let's fight that old nasty virus and that horrible, horrible thing and eliminate it by just taking a little bit of, of uh, germ killer, you put it on your hand and you rub it in really, really nice, you know, get into those finger crevices and webs and other uh, depositories of germs, you know, especially the thumb area, they say, right, Boris? And let's put a little bit here. Let's, there we go. Let's get a little bit on your talons as well, okay? Yes, that's right. You never know where Boris's talons have been. <laughs> well, that's our little tidbits and helpfully, helpfully, hopefully, helpful uh, out there to you. So let us, you know, get the old guardian angel out and put it on our backsides. And, well, you know, be safe out there, right, Boris? <laughs> Keep well. Stay inside. Watch more monster movies. And until next time, as always, keep screaming. Her disease has long baffled the skill of her physician. A settled apathy, a gradual wasting away, and frequent, although passing affections, of a partially cataleptical character. It's horrible. After my first meeting with Roderick, I was conducted to my room, where, exhausted by my long journey, I slept soundly, quite unaware of the evil which was revealed during the hours of darkness. Uh... 
So your friend has retired for the night. Yes. I can neither help hearing part of your conversation and am now convinced that you do not know the true nature of your illness or the mysteries surrounding this house. But now the time has come, my friend, when I think you should know the truth. Mystery? But why haven't you told me of this before? It is a sad and horrible story but one I fear that you must face before it is too late. Your illness and that of your sister is the result of a curse put on the house of Usher and its descendants by a man whom your father murdered many years ago. A man whom my father murdered? But I don't understand. If you allow me, I will explain it to you. But how do you know all this? Your father told me the secret just before he died. You remember that since you were children, he always impressed on you that you must never go into the marshes and woodlands that lie to the south of your estate, because they are so treacherous that no one has ever come out of them alive. Yes, I remember. That was partly true, but there was another reason why he wanted you to avoid those marshes. Beyond them is a temple which conceals a torture chamber built by your ancestors many years ago. It is there I must take you to learn the secret of your illness. I have here a plan which your father drew for me while telling me the secret. It shows the only safe path through the woods to the temple. Well, will you come with me?
The story I am about to tell you begins many years ago, when your mother was a young and beautiful woman. She had a secret lover whom she used to meet in this temple. This became known to your father, and one day he followed her, and, hiding in the woods over there, watched them meet and enter through this door. Prepare yourself for a great shock, as the sight you are about to see is unutterably evil. Fury and anger rose in your father, and he burst open the door and rushed at the lover, whom he easily overpowered. He strapped him to this rack and made him watch while he beat your mother. This enraged the lover who put a curse on the usher, saying that neither you nor your sister would live longer than 30 years, and then the house of Usher would finally fall. At this, your father swung round, and drawing his sword, with a mighty blow, beheaded him. But it was too late. The curse was spoken. The sight and horror of all this was too much for your mother. She was driven completely insane. Lost all powers of speech. Yes, that is your mother. Oh, she's harmless enough. But should you attempt to touch the head, she has the strength to tear you to pieces. The body decays, but the head lives on and has aged with time. There. What are we going to do? I have done all I can for you, but medical aid is useless against this guess. It is stronger than any human power and is slowly taking your lives. But we are both 30 next month. You must do something to save us. The only way to stop the curse taking effect is to burn the head. Yes, it is a dangerous task, but I think it can be done if we can get one other person to help us. Do you think your friend Jonathan would be willing to come with us? No, I would rather Jonathan knew nothing of this. But there is the gardener, Richard. He would help me, I'm sure. Good. Now, this is my plan. Two of us must try to overpower your mother while the other destroys the head. But supposing we fail? The alternative is to take the life of Lady Medellin. We must burn the head. know exactly what to do? Yes. Richard? Yes, sir. Very well, then.
Now. She's nothing, only a slight accident. I've been looking for Richard. Have you seen him? I sent him away early this morning. When will he be back? He will not be coming back. Anything troubling you, Lady Madeline? No. No, nothing, thank you. I was just looking at the horses. Morning, my lady. When did you last see him? Louise, tell me, when did you last see Richard? Last night, my lady. Where? I saw him from my window, going towards the woods with the master and Dr. Cordwell. Then, about an hour later, I saw the doctor helping the master back to the house. Richard was not with them. Louise? I'm afraid something terrible has happened to Richard. I shall need your help. Tonight, after Charles has given me my drink, I shall leave by the back stairs. You must meet me in the courtyard with my cloak. Yes, my lady. I will be there. Thank you. 
Will there be anything more this evening, my lady? No, thank you. Now, Louise, I want you to go back to the house. But, my lady, where are you going? To try and find out what has happened to Richard. Oh, no, my lady, don't go, love. I must try. My lady, there's a danger. Louise, you can help me most by going to your room and waiting for my return. If I'm not back within an hour, go to the master and tell him that I've gone to the temple. Tell the master that you've gone to the temple. Farewell, my lady.
such wonderful little houses, Boris. Such wonderful little haunted houses. <laughs> ah, what a wonderful film so far, eh, my dear fiends? And in honor of the fall of the House of Usher, uh, the Usher House, I thought, well, we would take a little look at some of my uh, collectibles, yeah, our scream houses, you might say. This is the Adams Family model uh, kit. Uh, house. <laughs> and you can even see Mortician and Gomez right there in the uh, windows as well as, well, there's Lurch it would seem. And window. We also have another wonderful scream house and that's the Psycho House. Well, from Psycho. <laughs> imagine, just imagine being in this house and uh, well, don't take a shower, shall we? <laughs> uh, you know, Edgar Allan Poe was such a wonderful writer. He was, well, misunderstood like many writers uh, when they were alive. Uh, he, he had so many fears and, and trepidations that, well, being buried alive, of course, I mentioned that one, and let's see, there, there were uh, tortures, being afraid of being tortured to death. Ah, there was the fear of losing your loved one. There was just so many fears that he, that he knew how to pick up on. And uh, of course, if you ever get a chance to pick up an old uh, tome of tales of Edgar Allan Poe from Randall House, Random House, please do. This is one of our uh, many books in the uh, library here at Gargoyle Manor. And I enjoy perusing it over and over and over. I mean, there's such, there's such uh, tales as the mystery of uh, Marie Roger, and let's see, The Adventure of Hans Fall, and well, let's see here if there, one more, what, 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 Li, The Tomb of Lygia, and of course, The Fall of the House of Usher. <laughs> uh, let's see. During the whole of a dull, dark, and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country, and at length found myself as the shades of the evening drew on within view of the melancholy house of Usher. Those are the first words that begins the story. <laughs> uh, you may have recognized them at the beginning of the film. They, uh, they also used it uh, word for word, mm, which is unusual for a Poe film. <laughs> right, Boris? So let's get back to tonight's feature, Fall of the House of Usher.
the matter. A woman, a woman to the temple. I fear this would happen. It took every precaution. I do not understand how she entered the house. We must be on our guard in case she makes another attempt. For several days, I have tried to alleviate the melancholy of my friend. We painted and read together, or I listened as if in a dream to the wild improvisations of his guitar. And the more a closer intimacy admitted me into the recesses of his spirit, the more I realized the futility of any attempt to cheer his darkened mind. The painting over which his elaborate fancy brooded made me shudder. His work arrested attention by its utter simplicity and the barrenness of his designs. If ever a mortal painted an idea, that man was Roderick Usher. I shall always bear the memory of the solemn hours I spent alone with the master of the house of Usher. After several days, he came to me. Lady Madeline is dead. Dead? Yes. She had been confined to her bed for several days. She grew weaker on the very night you came, after you saw her. She drew her last breath only a few minutes ago. I was with her when she died. As I watched the life of my beloved sister fade away, I was grimly reminded that when I too pass from this earth, the ancient family of ushers would pass with me and would crumble into the dust on which it was made. The ushers will soon pay the penalty for their pride. You wonder, Jonathan, how I felt at that dead sight, hardly venturing to move, hardly daring to breathe. My faith. I experienced not only pity, sorrow, and regret, but also, and worst of all, I felt alone and in the cold grip of fear. Perhaps not alone, Jonathan, for now that you are here, my loneliness is softened. But when you are gone, I shall dread the future more than ever before. The judgment of the ushers is beginning. Our long line is about to fall. Lady Madeline is no more. I intend to preserve the body in one of the vaults. There are many in the walls of this house. Considering the unusual character of her illness, and of certain inquiries by her physician and the remote exposed position of the family burial ground, I have decided to do so. I should appreciate your help, my friend, in the arrangements. I will do whatever I can. You can rely on my assistance, Roderick. At the request of Usher, I personally aided him in the arrangements for the temporary entombment. Then, the body having been placed in the coffin, we bore it to its rest.
What a wonderful magazine, a real magazine for monsters, for real monsters, eh, Boris? Just like you and I. What a wonderful uh, contents it has, and, and such great photographs as well. That's right, Scary Monsters uh, magazine, the uh, real monster magazine for real monsters. This one is a uh, the horticultural uh, horrors issue. <laughs> it's the 117th uh, hideous issue, it, would, it says right here. I mean, it has everything, even, well, an article about killer tomatoes. <laughs> Pick it up at your nearest ghoul stand, won't you? <laughs> I could see no way to relieve the distress of my friend. I could find no solution to his problem. It was late one night, some eight days after we had placed the body of Lady Madeline in the vault, a night when I was unable to sleep for a fast rising storm of a freak nature. I struggled to reason off the nervousness which gripped me. A disturbing influence, I knew not what, was at work in the house of Usher. I listened, I know not why. Instinctively, I felt that Roderick was uneasy too.
What is the matter? Why are you holding your gun like that? I thought it was her. I thought it was Madeline. What? What are you saying? Haven't you heard her? Haven't you heard the noises from the boat? Come. Sit down here and rest. I know what to do. I think I can help you. Well, where are you going with that gun? To the temple. Don't worry. You leave this to me. No, you mustn't kill her. Don't touch that door. Keep away from that door. Sleep. The noise. Let us close the window. The air is chilling and dangerous. I will read to you. Here is one of your favorite books. Perhaps it will help us pass this dreadful night together. And Ethelred, on account of the powerfulness of the wine he had drunk, waited no longer to speak to the hermit, who in truth was of an obstinate and maliceful turn. But feeling the rain upon his shoulders and fearing the rising of the tempest, uplifted his mace and with blows quickly made room for his gauntleted hand. And pulling sturdily, he cracked and ripped and tore asunder but the noise of the dry and hollow-sounding wood reverberated throughout the forest. champion Ethelred, now entering within the door, was enraged and amazed to perceive no signal of the hermit, but instead was a dragon of a scaly and prodigious demeanor, and with a fiery tongue, which sat on guard before a palace of gold with a floor of silver. And Ethelred uplifted his club and struck the dragon on the head with a shriek so horrible and piercing <laughs>
didn't you hear it? I've heard it for a long time. Yet I dare not. I dare not speak. She's alive, I tell you. We have put her living in the tomb. I tell you, I heard her first feeble movements in the hollow coffin many hours ago. Yet I dared not speak. And now, tonight, Ethelred and the breaking of the hermit's door, the death cry of the dragon and the clang of the shield. Say rather, the rending of her coffin and the breaking of the iron hinges of her prison and her struggles within the coppered archway of her vault. Haven't I heard her footsteps on the stairs? Haven't I heard the horrible, heavy beating of her heart? Madman! I tell you, she is now standing outside the door.
that is the end of the story. Buried alive? That takes a bit of swallowing. Talking of swallowing, how about another drink? Just to take the taste away. Ah, Bob. Well, I don't understand. Did they know she was alive when they put her in the coffin? Was she being slowly poisoned? What really killed them? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Wow, Boris, did you see that house? It really did fall. I mean, it wasn't just some proverbial uh, way of talking. I mean, I thought, well, there for a while that they were just talking about, you know, the fall of the ushers themselves, you know, a dying with that dreaded disease and curse, you know, whoa, the, the curse set up on them by their own mother and that head. <laughs> oh, that was something unusual. But anyway, yes, the whole entire house just seemed to fall apart. Huh. Well, that was amazingly <laughs> creepy. <laughs> right, Boris? <laughs> so glad that you all could uh, stick around and survive tonight's terror tale. <laughs> and, well, we hope that you'll come back for another episode coming soon to Monster Movie Night. I am your host, Bobby Gum Monster, along with Boris T. Buzzard, bidding you, as always, keep screaming.